Hello there. Welcome to the Potter's Wheel. I'm George Osmus. I'm one of the owners of Potter's Wheel Films, and I'll be your host for the next half hour. Many moons ago, PBS carried a program that featured an artist who would create these gorgeous, elaborate oil landscapes in the space of a single half hour program. His name was Bob Ross, and one of his trademarks was that he didn't believe in mistakes. He called them happy accidents. Well, for the next three episodes, I'm going to share a happy accident that literally changed my life. Let me tell you what happened. While the Lord was still laying the foundation of faith in my life, my associate pastor made a passing reference to Genesis 8.22, where the phrase seed time and harvest was coined. Now, at the time, I wasn't familiar with the verse or the promise that was being conveyed by the Lord in it, and I'd certainly never heard the word seed time before, but I had heard the words seed and time. So what I heard was seed, comma, time, comma, and harvest. Three items, not two. And my computer programmer brain translated what I had heard into an equation. Seed plus time equals harvest. Now, while not strictly biblically accurate, the Lord used this happy accident to begin to show me how all of life does, in fact, hinge on that equation. He also showed me how the principle works for good or for evil, depending on the type of seed being sown and other factors that we'll talk about. We'll begin exploring the implications of seed plus time equals harvest on today's episode of The Potter's Wheel. The prophets Isaiah and Jeremiah compared the people of God to clay and spoke of the Lord as a master potter. On its own, clay has no form, no purpose, but in the hands of the master, it can be shaped into a design of his choosing to serve his purpose. He has a number of tools to help him in his work. Chief among them is the potter's wheel. Here in the Midwest, we're all intimately familiar with the notion of planting seeds and bringing in a harvest. We're surrounded by fields that remind us of this on a daily basis. For viewers who might live in other areas, I've put together a short film to help illustrate what I'm gonna be talking about. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. Let's take just a minute to talk about the prophetic interpretation of seed plus time equals harvest. The seed represents the little things in life that, left unchecked, shape our lives. Specifically, I'm talking about our thoughts, our words, and our actions. It takes time for the planted seed to mature and produce its crop. During this time, the seed must be fertilized, nourished, and protected from critters who want to eat it or the elements that would destroy it. Harvest comes when the crop is fully matured. And let me say three quick things about the harvest. One, it's always many times greater than the seed that was sown. For example, a single kernel of corn, properly planted and tended, will produce a corn stalk with an ear of corn on it. That ear will contain hundreds of kernels, every one of which could conceivably become a corn stalk itself. Two, 
the harvest does not gather itself into the barn. The farmer has to go out into the field and get it. Finally, church, there is an enemy out there who lives for the chance to steal your harvest. Don't give it to him. Jesus said, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of his heart, his mouth speaks. Ralph Waldo Emerson is credited with a quote that probably best summarizes what I'm talking about. He said, sow a thought and you reap an action. Sow an act and you reap a habit. Sow a habit and you reap a character. Sow a character and you reap a destiny. In most cases, we have sown to the lives we are living right now. And whether that is a good thing or a bad thing largely depends on the kind of seed we've sown. The Bible has a lot to say about our thought life. Here's just a couple of examples. I would encourage you to dig into the word for yourself and see how many others you can find. Paul understood the importance of policing our own thought life, saying to the Philippian church, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Proverbs 23, 7 says that as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So what does this mean to us in practical terms? First of all, it is extremely important that the child of God learn to define himself or herself according to what God says about us, not what other people and certainly not some demon from hell says about us. Our internal self-talk goes a long way toward establishing our outlook on life. If that internal self-talk is helpful and encouraging and positive, like by reading the Word, we will likely be helpful, encouraging, and positive people. If it's not, well, <laughs> draw your own conclusions. We live in a world where there are hundreds of competing voices who love to try to tell us who we are, where we came from, and where we're going. But church, the only one who can legitimately tell us these things is God. And praise be to Him, He has done exactly that. He has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. We have His Word, which makes His will and His ways known. We don't have to be confused about what is sin and what is righteous. He has defined it for us. Most of the choices we're called to make in life, He has already told us in His Word what to choose. He also gave us His Son, Jesus Christ, to pay the price for our sins. Make no mistake about it, God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself through the blood of his cross. His death, burial, and resurrection purchase salvation for all who will obey his command to repent and believe in the gospel. Finally, he has given us his spirit, who is our guarantee of our inheritance and our seal against the day when God's wrath will be poured out on the sons of disobedience. That day is coming, folks, and no amount of money, good works, or self-righteousness can save you from it. Only Jesus can do that. So again, I plead with you by the mercies of God, be reconciled to God through Christ now while there is yet time. So I said earlier that the child of God needs to define himself according to God's word. The Bible says that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new man and the word is filled with verses that describe the character and define the behavior of the new man. Part of becoming a disciple of Christ, going from a babe in Christ to a fully mature son of God, is to learn and apply these verses to yourself. One of the things that helped me when I was confronted with this reality is to take a notebook and begin making a list of all the scriptures that I encountered that told me who I am in Christ. Then I began reading those scriptures out loud over my life daily before I left the house. A lot of times I would preach myself happy. The longer that list got, the more my self-image and thought life began to conform to God's definition than that of the old man. This was one of the methods God used to get me to put off the old man and put on the new man created in true righteousness and holiness. This leads me to the next type of seed I want to talk about, our words. Again, the Bible has plenty to say about the power of the spoken word. Going back to the beginning, God spoke creation into being. 
And while our words don't have quite that much power, their influence is significant, and Scripture does recognize this. Proverbs 18.21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Jesus said that his words are spirit, and they are life. I believe our words are also spirit, but whether they are life or death, eh, well, let's just say I could stand some improvement in that area. How about you? James had some powerful insights into the power of the tongue. Listen to what he has to say. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and creature of the sea, is tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. We need to watch what comes out of our mouths, saints. We need to make sure that we are speaking life over our own lives and the lives of those around us. We need to be ready to offer words of encouragement or comfort to those who need it. What we say to others in their time of need and trial and struggle is either going to strengthen their faith or give more power to the unholy trinity, doubt, fear, and unbelief. What would you rather do? Help somebody endure and overcome or be the reason they give up and live in defeat? The writer of Hebrews reminds us to exhort one another and to stir up love and good works. Which leads me to the next type of seed I want to talk about, our works. I know many consider work to be a four-letter word, but can I offer a gentle reminder to you that the command to work came before the fall? Work is not part of the curse, no matter what it might feel like sometimes. Sorry about your doctrine. So what role do our works play in the life of a Christian? James had some very pointed things to say on the matter. He says, What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to him, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God. You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works, faith was made perfect? In short, genuine faith will always produce good works. Jesus said it this way, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. No one who knows the Lord and knows his word would suggest that we are saved by our works. But we can't deny the truth that we are saved for good works either. Everybody knows Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, where Paul says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. But have you ever read the next verse? For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. My wife and I are intimately familiar with this verse. When we first met, I was out of town on a business trip, and we were texting back and forth. I forget what she said exactly, but my response was to quote Ephesians 2.10. And as I did so, the truth of that scripture, we are his workmanship, resonated so strongly that I knew by the Spirit of God that God had brought us together and intended us for one another. Ephesians 2.10 has become one of the spiritual touchstones of our life together and a frequent prayer point as we ask him to lead us in those good works that he has for us to do. As the days get darker and darker, the opportunities to do good will continue to grow. People will be hurting more and more saints, and the more that we can do to meet their practical needs, 
like James talked about, the more open they will be to listening to us when we tell them about Jesus. This doesn't mean you have to go open a soup kitchen or something like that. You can do a good work just by paying for the guy behind you in the drive through line. So what good works has the Lord called you to do? Well, that's something you need to work out with the Lord as you walk with Him. The good works that God has for us are unique to everyone. No one can do your work for you, and you can't do someone else's work for them. The best encouragement I can give you is to promise you that He will lead you in them when you are mature enough to carry them out. And we'll talk about that more next week. We've been talking about good seed that we can sow, but before we go to the break, I want to talk about bad seeds. Again, the same categories exist, thoughts, words, and actions. We have an enemy out there that just loves to sow self-destructive thoughts into our mind, will, and emotions. I mentioned the unholy trinity earlier, doubt, fear, and unbelief. And these are things we definitely need to be mindful of and to learn how to cast down when they come. Policing your own thought life is a major part of the spiritual warfare in which we are all engaged. Paul said, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments at every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. What are some of the high things that Paul is talking about here? Some might say that they are principalities and powers and rulers of spiritual wickedness, and that might be so. But in the context of this scripture, I have to include heretical doctrines, theologies, man-made philosophies that deny Christ and reject the authority of Scripture in that list too. That's why we need to know the Word, church. That's how we recognize these demonic teachings and reject them before they can lead us astray. When it comes to our words, obviously profanity is one type of bad seed. Paul said, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. But, you know, I don't think he was just talking about profanity here. A corrupt word can be a word that expresses and gives power and credence to doubt, fear, and unbelief. A corrupt word can also be an unkind, snarky remark or an impatient outburst. Perhaps the most easily recognized bad seed are our actions. You don't have to be head cashier at the Walmart to figure out that breaking any of the Ten Commandments is a bad seed that's going to produce some very negative circumstances in your life. Even today, in our lawless age, some folks still go to jail for breaking some of them. The ones like, you shall not steal and you shall not commit murder. Those are big, glaring examples, easy to spot. But what about a little thing, like, say, a high school student blowing off a homework assignment? That's no big deal, right? Might be a bigger deal than you think. You see, by blowing off that assignment, you're now unprepared for the test, so you do poorly. Maybe even fail that test. Fail enough tests, and you fail the class. Fail enough classes, and maybe you don't get to graduate and get your diploma or degree. Oh, that's just a piece of paper, you say. Well, that piece of paper is the difference between a minimum wage job that has you slaving away, jockeying a cash register, or flipping burgers for the rest of your life, and having a well-paying, satisfying career that provides for you and your family. How important does that homework assignment look now? We've talked a lot about the quality of the seed, but is that the only factor to consider when it comes to our seed? No. There's also the question of how we sow the seed that we have been given. That has an impact on our harvest, again, for good or ill. And we'll talk more about that after these words from Potter's Wheel Films. They say a picture is worth a thousand words. So what do you suppose a thousand pictures would be worth? At Potter's Wheel Films, we want to help you find out. We're a Christian film company. We make movies and TV shows that preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, teach biblical life principles, and encourage other believers in their faith walk. We're also here to help Christian churches, ministries, performing artists, and others with their digital media needs. We're ready to take on any size project, from a 30-second teaser spot to a 30-minute TV show and beyond. We want to use our tools and talent to help you expand your audience and increase your impact in the community. Contact us at 217-494-7798 or by email at potterswheelfilms at gmail.com and let us open the world of digital video media to you. 
Welcome back. While providing some instruction and encouragement to the Corinthian church on the subject of giving, Paul said, But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. As with many kingdom principles, there are applications beyond the narrow confines of the immediate context of the verse. The principle of sowing and reaping appears throughout Scripture. The psalmist, for example, said, Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Sowing is hard work, but it's necessary work. For without the sowing, there can be no harvest, regardless of what some certain political parties might want you to believe. Jesus taught on the importance of how we sow our seed in the parable of the talents. If you aren't familiar with it, you can find it in Matthew 25, verses 14 through 30. I would encourage you to get familiar with all the Lord's parables because they contain kingdom principles that will bless your life when they are applied and will make your life harder when they're ignored. To briefly recap, a man gave one servant five talents, another got two, and the last one got one. The servants who were given five and two talents both went and traded with them and doubled their boss's money. The servant with one talent had some wrong ideas about his boss's character, so he hid the talent and gained nothing for his boss while he was out of town. The first two servants sowed their seed, and fairly bountifully, I would assume, and received praise from the master. Is there anything better you can hear from the Lord than, well done, good and faithful servant? Not only did they get the verbal pats on the back, but by demonstrating their faithfulness, the master could trust them with greater and greater responsibilities. Unfortunately, it did not go well for the servant with the one talent. Far from being praised, the master calls him wicked and lazy, throws the servant's own bogus judgment back in his face, and he even has his one talent taken away from him while he himself was cast into outer darkness. I want you to pay close attention to the lesson Jesus gave at the end of this parable, okay? Because it is very important, and I don't think we of the American church really understand its implications. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. Income equity is a popular rallying cry these days, but, you know, I don't think that idea is going to fly in the kingdom. See, God is into sowing and reaping. He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. He didn't reward that lazy servant. He fired him. God expects His people to work, folks. No getting around it. Like I said earlier, we all know we're not saved by our works, but we are saved for good works. The parable of the talents is a warning to all those who think they can confess Jesus as their Savior and just continue living their own lives and doing their own thing. really doesn't work that way. You do well to remember that whenever the phrases outer darkness and weeping and gnashing of teeth appear, the context is always one of being thrown out of the kingdom. It's talking about hell, folks. Check yourself before you wreck yourself. We can't afford to forget that there is a judgment associated with our works, church. The things we do in this life, good or bad, righteous or wicked, will one day be judged by the Lord. I'm honestly concerned for some folk who seem to think Jesus is always the kind, patient, forgiving lamb. We need to remember that he was also perfectly capable of righteous anger and flipping tables when he had to. Hear what Paul had to say about the judgment on our works. According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved yet so as through fire. It can't be stressed enough. How our works are judged is not going to be random. It's not going to be an accident, and it's not going to be wrong. 
We choose what we do with our lives. We are responsible for what we have done with the seeds we have been given. What will you do with your time, your tools, your talents, your treasure? Will you squander what you've been given on the passing pleasures of sin like the prodigal son? Or will you spend it all on building your own kingdom? Or will you surrender it all back to the Lord and use it to build His kingdom? The choice is yours. I pray you make a wise one. Before we go, I think it's important to take note of the fact that we are not the only ones sowing into our lives and that we sow into the lives of the people around us. Not only that, we have an enemy who deliberately sows bad seed into our lives too. He did it to God's field, which is the world, as Jesus explained in the parable of the wheat and the tares. Another parable he put forth to them saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field, but while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. The servants said to him, You want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, First gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. I love this parable because Jesus himself gave the interpretation, so I don't have to strain my brain to understand the symbols. And apparently, I'm in pretty good company because the disciples themselves asked him to explain it to them. He answered and said to them, He who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out His angels, and they will gather out of His kingdom all things that offend, and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Again, it's not an accident of birth whether you're a son of the kingdom or a son of the wicked one. Everyone who is today counted a son of the kingdom started out as a son of the wicked one. We became sons of the kingdom when we obeyed the command of Jesus to repent and believe in the gospel. This parable is not describing predestination. It's accurately representing that there are but two kinds of people in the world. Those who choose to obey God and those who choose to disobey, those who offend, those who practice lawlessness. And by the way, offend who? Offend God. Believe it or not, God can be offended. Think about that. These people are the first to be gathered together, and they are bound and cast into the fire. Only after that is the wheat, the righteous sons of the kingdom, gathered into his barn. Draw from that what you will. We're almost out of time, so let me recap for you. There are two kinds of seed we can sow, good seed or bad seed. The quality of our harvest is determined by the quality of the seed and the quantity in which it is sown. Be mindful of what we let others sow into our field and what we are sowing into theirs. When we find we've sown bad seed, don't despair. You can still repent and pray for crop failure. Doesn't mean it will always happen, but I do believe a repentant heart will mitigate the harvest of a bad seed. Let's close in prayer. Thank you, Lord, for the good seed of your word. I plead the blood of Jesus over what I've sown into the lives of the viewers that it should be protected from the enemy who comes immediately to steal it. Help us to prepare the ground of our heart to receive it. By your spirit, remove the thorns and the thistles, the cares of this life. Help us develop strong roots in righteousness so that when the fires of persecution come, we can endure. Show us the hard, stony places of rebellion and pride that prevent your word from taking root in us. May we have grace to apply the wisdom of your word to know how to properly sow the good seed we have been given in other areas of life. 
Help us to understand, Lord, your principle of seed time and harvest. We ask for your spirit to correct us when we begin to sow bad seed into our own life or into our neighbors. Help us to sow good seed bountifully and bad seed sparingly. Have mercy on your people, Lord, and grant crop failure over every bad seed we've sown in Jesus' name. God bless. Thank you.